Good evening, everyone, to uh, Pearls of Grace Fellowship Sunday evening service. We've just had our praise and worship, and we sang about turning our eyes towards Jesus. And the other one was nearer like God to thee. Um, as believers, we should always be getting nearer to God, closer to him. We really should. To open us up in prayer. Nelson, brother, would you open us up in prayer, please? Loving Father, we come unto you this time to worship you, to glorify you, and to bless you, Father. We love you. Father, we are ready to hear from you. Send the Holy Spirit to talk to us, God through your servant. This fellowship is unto you, Father. As the, every day we are closing near to you, near to you, we ask you, Father, to come near to us in this fellowship. Father, let the word which is going to be preached sink into our heart and the action we walk in it because we are determined to be the light of this world to preach the gospel. Bless us, Father, this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother, for that. Tonight, I want to talk about probably a little unknown book that probably a lot of us just sort of whiz by and just don't take much heed of. I'll give you the name of it in a minute. But uh, I have entitled tonight's talk um god's mercy and judgment i'll read a few verses of the first chapter god is jealous and the lord avenges the lord avenges it and is furious the lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way. In the whirlwind and the storm and in the cloud are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the Lord and all who dwell in it. You can stand before his indignation and, oh sorry, who can stand again, forgive me, who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who trust him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place and a darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you know? Conspire against the Lord. He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For wild tangled like thorns and wild drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried there are several more verses to that chapter but i think we'll stop there and i love that verse seven the lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who trust him but let's cast our memories back um written in the Bible and really 140 years prior to what I'm going to be talking about tonight, 148 years prior, was the book of Jonah. And you remember Jonah, God wanted him to go to Nineveh and tell the people uh, about their bad wicked ways and uh, that God was going to forgive them. But Jonah didn't like the uh, Nivenites and he didn't want to go because he didn't want God to save them. So he ran from God. Remember, he got on a boat and he sailed away and everything. 
but God caused a storm and uh, Jonah ended up in the belly of a whale and three days and three nights. And we all know the story then. Jonah decided to go and speak to the uh, people of Nineveh. What I love about that story too is that in the end uh, of the uh, story that there was no shelter, uh, yeah, no shelter, no, no shade for uh, Jonah. And uh, God provide a lovely big plant that Jonah was able to sit under in the shade of the hot sun. But then God killed the plant. He made the plant wither up and die. Why did he do that? Because Jonah was getting really too comfortable again there and wasn't going to move. So God made him step out of his comfort zone is what I believe. So that was the book of Jonah. So as I said, what, that was 140 years back we went. So jump 148 years now and to the scriptures that I just read some of. And what do we have? We have Nahum. Three chapters long, but my goodness me, what powerful punch is in those three chapters. So um, I've already spoken uh, some verses on chapter one. Um, and I'll pick a couple of verses, maybe at random on chapter two and three, or maybe just three. We'll see how time goes. Nahum's name means comfort or consolation. I think comfort sounds a nicer name. But Nahum, the message he brought to the people of Nineveh again, was anything but comforting. It was the, it was the, the Assyrians had taken over Nineveh. Now, the whole book of Nahum, it's filled with vivid imagery and poetic language. If you all haven't read it in a long while, if you've got time later tonight after the uh, uh, church service is over, Go and have a read on it. It's only three chapters long and you could read it in about half an hour at the most. But God announces judgment on Nineveh for cruelty, arrogance and idolatry. Now, let's say the book of uh, Nahum is only three chapters long and it's broken down as such. Chapter one is the wrath and majesty of God. Chapter two is the fall of Nineveh and chapter three is the utter ruin of Nineveh. All right. Right. <laughs> Excuse me folks, sorry about that. Pardon me. In chapter one, the very first chapter, it introduces us to Nahum. Na read Nahum's central theme, and it's the wrath of God against Nineveh. Now, it opens with, um, if you remember what I read, it, 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 it opens with the depiction of God as a jealous and avenging God. Right? A God whose wrath is fierce but who is also a, a, ref, a refuge to those who trust in him. Now, Nahum pronounces woe upon Nineveh, and it states that God will not leave the guilty unpunished. He then contrasts uh, this with the assurance that God will bring deliverance and restoration to Judah. And if we jump to chapter two, which is I called it the, the fall of Nineveh. Well, actually, not I've called it the um, heading on my study Bible calls it the fall of Nineveh. But in chapter two, it really is a dramatic portrayal of the siege and the fall of Nineveh. As I say before, folks, if you haven't read it in a long time, you've got to go back and refresh, refresh your memories in this because it really is three powerful chapters. But Nahum really uses vivid uh, imagery to describe the attacking army. 
you know, the chariots, the defences and the, of the city, and uh, ultimately the plunder and the collapse of uh, the city. And the chapter also characterises Nineveh as a den of lions who fed on the blood of nations. Doesn't sound like a very nice place, does it? Yeah. You know, but so the fed on the blood of nations, but now their voices are silenced and their power is broken. Chapter three, again, my study Bible titles this The Utter Ruin of Nineveh. Excuse me. And I do want to read some verses from chapter three. And from the NLT version, the first version I read uh, was New King James. I forgot to say that, folks, sorry. And now I'm going to read from the uh, New NLT. Uh, New Living Translation. And it's, what sorrow awaits Nineveh, the city of murder and lies? She is crammed with wealth and is never without victims. Hear the crack of whips, the rumble of wheels, horses hooves pound and chariots clatter wildly. See the flashing swords and glittering spears as the charioteers charge past. There are countless casualties heaps of bodies, so many bodies that people stumble over them. All this is because Nineveh, the beautiful and faithless city, mistress of deadly charms, enticed the nations with her beauty. She taught them all her magic, enchanting people everywhere. I am your an enemy, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And I, and now I will lift your skirts and show all the earth your nakedness and shame. I will cover you with filth and show the world how vile you really are. All who see you will shrink back and say, men have a lies and ruins. Where are the mourners? Does anyone regret your destruction? That's powerful, I think. Yep. This final chapter. Nahum paints a picture, enumerates the reasons for Nineveh's downfall. He speaks of the city's bloodshed, lies, and relentless cruelty. Nahum also declares that all who hear of Nineveh's fall will clap their hands in joy due to that relentless terror it has spread in the past. The chapter and the whole book, but the, 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 the chapter three, it really concludes with a stern declaration that Nineveh's destruction is final and that there is no healing for its wounds. Remember in Jonah, 148 years prior to this, the, the people of Nineveh turned from their wicked ways. <coughs> Pardon me, folks. And God didn't do anything to them. But apparently, 148 years down the road, they've gone back to their wicked ways and they're doing horrible things. And God's wrath is coming upon them. Now, you really could make a story, a child's story, an adventure story out of this. And if any of you can, can remember the way I, uh, I love to start the story of Esther. And I would start this one the same way. It would be, you know, once upon a time, there was a city called Nineveh. And imagine the city where bullies roamed the streets, taking stuff from people and acting like they owned the place. Well. That's how Nineveh was. They weren't nice at all. They hurt people and thought they were the toughest and the best. 
then there was a man named Nahum. Nahum was a kind of like a messenger who got special messages from God. And one day God told Nahum, go to Nineveh and tell everyone that he was really, really, really mad at Nineveh. God was like a dad who thought enough of his kids' naughty behavior. Or sorry, who had enough of his kids' naughty behavior, I should say. And Nahum told everyone that God was going to punish Nineveh because they acted so badly. Nahum said, God is usually super nice and protects uh, good people. It's like a big, cozy blanket that you can just cuddle up with and he protects you. But if you're nasty, mean and nasty, like Nineveh, then you better watch out. And Nahum told everyone that God was going to send an army to grind Nineveh, to level it to the ground. Just like a parent grinds a naughty child, puts him on the naughty step. And guess what? It happened. An army came with loads of soldiers and there was huge big ruckus and chariots and horses were all over the place and swords and soldiers and everything. And Nineveh's big strong walls couldn't hold them back. They lost all their stolen treasures. <laughs> Nahum's story shows, really does show folks that when people act like bullies and are mean to others, there's always a day when they have to face the music. And it also tells us that God is, is like a super dad, kind and caring to those who are good. But he won't let bullies off the hook. He won't. Right. I think the way maybe to tie the whole thing all together would be that Book of Nahum, to me, it stands as a thunderous statement to the justice of God. And through the potent imagery and reverent uh, declarations, Nahum portrays the downfall of Nineveh as a direct consequence of its wickedness and brutality. And while the book primarily focuses on judgment, it also subtly reminds us, yes, very subtly reminds us of God's refuge and protection for those who trust him. And that's verse seven, chapter one, verse seven. You can hear Nahum's voice reverberating through time, reminding us that the Lord is sovereign and that his justice, though sometimes seemingly slow, 148 years it took, but seemingly slow, it's always certain. And we, people, we believers. No, I'm going to say you because I've already done this. I have done this. Uh, but you believers, you need to get over your fears. And why? Because our fears can, will and do destroy us. If we allow our fears to control our lives, folks, think the people of Judah lived under the fear of attack from the Assyrians for many years. Nahum comforted them. All right. He 
helped comfort them by helping them turn their eyes, focus, attention away from the enemy and toward their powerful and loving God. Nahum called the people to make God the source of their spring. It, the enemy forces that try to get us away from God and living just the way God wants us to live comes at us in many, many, many different forms of attacks. We just need to focus on the struggles we're facing. And if we took on too much, we'd become overwhelmed. Some people can't wait for trouble to come to their doorstep. They'll go out, run down the street, run down the road, run into the town and grab it with both hands and drag it back to their doorsteps. That's not doing anybody any good. If troubles come to your door, keep your eyes, turn your eyes to Jesus. You'll find your strength from him. Don't be coming overwhelmed with everything. The way the people feared the Assyrians running about and just fearing and cowing and fear. God wants a better life for you than that. We want to become overwhelmed if we keep our eyes fixed on God who loves us. And the God who loves us wants and desires only the very best for us. And if we can keep our focus in him, look to him for our strength, the way Nahum encouraged the people of Nineveh, sorry, the people of Judah to do that, our fears will vanish too. They'll just go away. We can, we should count on God to help us through all of our spiritual battles, folks. Right. How many of you really realize that God created us to be the very best when we do things his way? Do you realize that? Do things his way. You'll be the very best. And the people of Nineveh, oh my goodness me, they broke all God's commands, instructions, laws. And they were allowed to continue it. And they were allowed to continue in that really destructive behavior for. Yeah, a considerable amount of time, 148 years. Before their consequences caught up with them. And caught up with them they did. We don't follow what God wants us to do. You've heard me say before, folks, that we can't walk with God and hold hands with the devil. You either got to be in, yeah, one camp or the other. You can't sit in a fence and have a foot dangling in each camp. Use God when you want him and use Satan when you want him. You can't do that. It's got to be one or the other. Choose God. Choose his ways. Don't be like the people of Nineveh and be destroyed. Don't be like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and be destroyed as well. Yep, that's Old Testament. And God was a very vengeful God, very wrathful God. And he still is. When Jesus comes again, 
He's coming to wreak havoc on the earth, what the wickedness has done. Be on the right side, folks. I think that's all I'm going to say. I will say good night to if there's anyone watching on Facebook. I'm not terribly sure. I think there is. But good night anyway to those watching on Facebook. Um, and if you're watching this on playback, either on Facebook or on YouTube or anywhere, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, I really am asking you consider doing it now. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Do it now. Don't 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 keep thinking that I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. Do it now. Because time really is running out. Time is short. If you'd like to talk with any one of us from Pearls of Grace Ministries about helping you make that decision for Christ, get in touch with us and someone will speak with you. If you made a decision for Christ a long time ago, but you've strayed away, get in touch with us and let us help you get back on the right road again. If you want prayer for anything, or even just someone to talk to, you've got problems you want someone to talk to, we're great at listening. Get in touch with us. I do hope that God blesses each and every one of you. And until our next video on Tuesday night, we will see you then. Goodbye.